You're listening to Precinct 444, a podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. This is Thomas Canavan, Executive Director of the National Law Enforcement Museum. Today we're returning with more special bonus content from our Precinct 444 podcast. This is part two of a three-part special 20 years after the Beltway Sniper. This special series is brought to you by Off-Duty Management. Off-Duty Management is dedicated to supporting and protecting law enforcement agencies, their offers, and community vendors. By offering a fully customizable, centrally administered, no-cost solution that manages all aspects of off-duty programs and keeps agencies in full control, mitigating their risk and liability. You can learn more about them at offdutymanagement.com. In part two, we'll consider the story of Virginia State Trooper Mark Coslett. During the sniper investigation, news coverage was full of stories of the deaths of innocent victims targeted by the mysterious sniper. One death that did not get the same spotlight, however, was that of Trooper Coslett. Although he's not killed by the sniper's rifle, he remains an indirect casualty of the DC sniper's reign of terror. We're grateful that several of his colleagues from the Virginia State Police joined us in our podcast studio to share their stories and memories of Trooper Coslett. You'll hear from Sergeant Dean Jones, who has retired from the Virginia State Police but is currently doing background investigations, Trooper Tim Confroy, and retired Trooper Patrick Boland, plus written remarks from Lieutenant Colonel Matthew D. Hanley of the Virginia State Police, who was on duty and unable to join us in the studio. They were joined in the studio by two members of our officer safety and wellness team, Troy Anderson, executive director, and Matt Garcia, project manager. We now present 20 years after the Beltway Sniper, part two, considering Trooper Coslett. We're here in Washington, D.C., in the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Museum, only steps away from the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. This museum tells the story of American law enforcement in a way that is designed to pay tribute to the profession. The memorial is a place where the names of 23,229 fallen officers are etched upon the walls. It was thoughtfully designed to be a peaceful site of healing and remembrance. Behind each of those names is a story, stories of heroism and sacrifice, stories of families and co-workers who have suffered through an unimaginable loss. One of those names is Senior Trooper Charles Mark Coslett, badge 968 of the Virginia State Police. Today we are going to be discussing the life of Trooper Coslett, his lasting impact on law enforcement, the role he played in the story of the DC sniper investigation, and his timeless memory. Trooper Coslett was killed in the line of duty on October 23, 2002 in Fairfax County, Virginia, while responding to what was reported as a potential active DC sniper shooting event. Trooper Coslett was assisting his colleagues with that sniper investigation. He was operating his department motorcycle on I-95 when he was involved in a traffic collision. Trooper Coslett was 40 years old at the time of his death and had honorably served the Virginia State Police for 16 years and was a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He left behind his wife, a son, and a daughter. My name is Troy Anderson. I'm the Executive Director of the Officer Safety and Wellness here at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. I'm also being joined by Matthew Garcia, who is a project manager overseeing our ambassador program in our OSW programs. Prior to joining the team here, I had a 30 plus law enforcement career, 26 of those of the Connecticut State Police, retiring as the Director of Trooper and Wellness and Resilience. Behind the word dad, there is no title I enjoyed more than being called a trooper. Joining me today are several of Trooper Coslett's friends and colleagues who will be sharing personal and professional memories of Trooper Coslett's life and his tragic loss. Tim Confoy is joining us here today. Please share with with our listeners your relationship with Trooper Coslett and what you remember about him. Good morning. Thanks for having us here. Um, I am Tim Confroy. I'm a Master Trooper, 27 years, uh, signed a safety division here in Northern Virginia, Fairfax, 
and I'm the current president of the Virginia State Police Association. Uh, when I met Mark, I was a brand new trooper. He was the old man on the squad, C shift. Well, I was C shift. And um, so he was one of the older guys that uh, mentored everybody and brought you along. And, uh, you know, even outside of work, he was a great guy. He took everybody under his wing and um, just a friend to everyone. Easy, easy person to get to know. And um, uh, just one of the guys that, you know, taught you how to do things. He was kind of a little bit of a legend. Hmm. He'd seen everything, done everything, did it all well. And he was just a little bit crazy, which helped get to know him too. So uh, Mark, you know, became a friend of mine. Uh, you know, kind of brought me into his little circle. And uh, it was just a pleasure to know him for the short amount of time that I did. I think, let's see, he had, I came on in 95, so five, six, seven years. Uh, first, the first uh, friend of mine that was a trooper uh, that died, line of duty. So that had a pretty profound impact, me being that, being a baby trooper, you know, five years in. You bet. So, yeah. You bet. Also with us is Pat Boland. Pat, will you share with us also your, your relationship and kind of what you remember most? Good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, Patrick Boland. Uh, Mark was one of the first people that when I started with the state police in 1989 that, that uh, I looked up to and, and saw him on the motor and said, I want to be on the motor just like Mark. And that's eventually what I got on motors and was with Mark and like Tim said, just Mark was a legend. He, anytime I had a question about drugs or searching the vehicle, Mark was there. He knew if I needed backup on a, on a truck bust, Mark was there. I could always count on Mark. I knew if Mark was listening to his radio, even if he was a home off duty, he'd come out. And Mark, uh, he uh, did some uh, undercover work. And I remember a couple of times that I backed him up. He called me and I thought that was for him to call me. It really, really uh, affected me, I guess. You'd say mm -hmm. he was uh, my best friend. Don't know if I was Mark's best friend. I think he had a few of them, but Mark, uh, he was my best friend. That's great. Thank you. Lastly, Dean Jones. Dean, I'm looking over at you, and just in our pre-interview conversation, I can tell you've got a lot of stories. I bet you could tell stories of the road for a while, but tell us what you remember most about Mark and kind of what your relationship was. Well, Dean Jones, I was the motor sergeant um, at the time. Uh, I've been, I was a sergeant uh, 27 years, 41 years with the department. Um, and uh, when I met Mark, he was larger than life. Um, he uh, knew everything, did everything his way. Uh, he was a person that you didn't have to supervise. He was a person that got out, knew his job, and did it well. Uh, and so I kind of left him alone, let him do his thing. And uh, more or less, he was a leader. He taught people how to do the job, especially motors. He loved riding a motorcycle so much. Um, I liked him. He, he was a good person. He loved his wife and family. He loved his job. He loved doing his job. And um, uh, that's what I like most about him. Um, he was uh, one of a kind, and we do have a lot of stories about him. Uh, he, was, uh, he was off that day. He was working an overtime thing, and he just left his uh, kid's school. And uh, the call came out, uh, and uh, I was coming down 495 uh, at the time, and uh, uh, they called and said he'd been involved in a wreck, and it just uh, went downhill from there. Um, it was probably the most, the largest one event that I remember 
in my life, not only with the department, but in my life. Um, and I never thought it would happen to us. I guess everybody thinks that. Uh, but he was doing what he wanted to do. He was riding a motorcycle, and uh, that's what he was all about. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. We sat down and talked for a couple hours about Mark Coslett stories. Um, there's some we can tell and there's some we can't tell. Uh, but uh, he was one of a kind and uh, we loved him very much. Um, he was not one of my troopers. He, uh, at that time, um, I was the motor supervisor, but we didn't have a unit. They came off the shifts to ride motorcycles on assignments. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. I would take them off the shift and we would do assignments on the motorcycles. So, uh, uh, 20 years, it's, uh, it, it's just like yesterday, uh, thinking about it, of what happened. Um, but that's, that's what I knew about Mark. So let me circle back. So he left his kid's school mm -hmm. that day, the, the week, the weeks, for several weeks, you know, this thing had dragged on with the sniper. So, uh, whether he was working or not, Mark lived near his kid's school, obviously. He would hop on the motorcycle and he'd wait outside the school in uniform for all the parents that were dropping their kids off just so he could be seen. So that the families dropping off their kids knew that there was somebody there. Sure. He just did it on his own. Nobody asked him to do it. So he wrapped up his assignment, swung by the school on his way home, and then the office was between school and his home. They were working out a little trailer at the time in Springfield, I think, where they were building an office and doing road construction. Anybody in Northern Virginia knows that there's always road construction. So mm -hmm. so he popped by the office when the car came out and uh, headed down, just jumped on his bike, went straight away, jumped into Springfield, mix and bowl, and headed south on 95 when it happened. So, you know, he just, nobody asked him to do it. It's just what he knew he had to do leading up to it. Calm, he was calming the kids and handing out trooper badges and coloring books and just being a presence and they loved that. Sounds like a special guy. Very, very special. Not just a special guy, but a special friend and a special trooper. You know, it's, you know, we all, we always talk about never forget, right? Because that's, that's something that's so near and dear to our memorial here. And, and we all, we all want to think that if it were one of us that fell, that, that people would be talking about us 20 years later or 30 or 40 years later. And if we're all around long, maybe we'll come back and have this conversation in another 30 years and we'll make it a 50th anniversary. But it is very clear the impression, you know, that he has made on, on all of you. And I can just, I can see it in your faces that, you know, that that, that, that relationship was just very, very near and dear. And one that is, uh, you know, his, his presence is missed 20 years later, which that says so much, it really does. Uh, if I could, and of course, you folks were in the DMV area back in uh, during the DC sniper investigation, and I'll call it that. I know it goes by a number of different names, but if you could kind of paint a picture for us of what the climate was like back then, what it was like to be in the DMV area, and the other part for me is what was it like as a law enforcement officer, because that's a little different. If you were just somebody who was going to fill up your gas tank at the gas station, I can understand being very concerned, fearful even. But what would it like being in law enforcement and having, you know, sort of balancing that side of of being able to navigate through that? What was the climate like? Well, we uh, we had lookouts um, and we were everywhere. We 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 shut down highways. Uh, we had checking details and uh, it, it it the information we got at one point was it was a white van we were looking for a white van. So we, uh, as uh, I'm not sure about the other agencies, but our agency, uh, every time we saw a white van, we stopped it and we checked it out. And there's more than one time that we had the people outside the van checking them out. Uh, and we, we must've stopped hundreds of vans uh, uh, because we, we uh, there, there was uh, information saying that uh, that it was a, a white van that was involved in the in the in the shootings, so there for a while that's all we were doing is uh, looking for white vans, uh, 
um, which turned out to be wrong. Uh, and looking back on it, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time searching things we didn't have to search. Uh, we were looking at the wrong areas and the wrong wrong types of vehicles and things like that. But it was uh, it was scary um, um, for the people, for the normal citizens, and you could tell. Uh, when we stopped these vehicles, we stopped hundreds of them. We never got one complaint uh, uh, from these people. And some people understood. probably multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah everybody could be work one guy who said he'd been stopped six times. He'd been searched six times, and he was on the ground one time. And he and he and every time he did it, he said he got up and said, "Thank you very much. I appreciate you looking." So. Every time a citizen called into our dispatch, and the dispatch put that information out to us, we acted on it immediately, and did what we had to do. And just on patrol, going around uh, on the on the motor, going by gas stations, you'd see people, the fear, rushing, you know, out of the car, getting their gas. You'd see people doing jumping jacks, moving around quickly because uh, they were so scared and, and did their business and they were gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, I just, I try to imagine what that must have been like, you know, being in law enforcement and also, you know, kind of having family that are in the community. And, you know, it sort of reminds me to some degree of even what we went through with some of these COVID-19 lockdowns, like just being afraid to leave your home, right? The, the initial phases of that. Um, what do you remember most about the day the Trooper Cossett was killed? I remember everything about the day. Um, uh, we were we were uh, responding to the call, and I was on 495 and less than three miles from where it happened. So uh, uh, they called on the radio and said that uh, that Mark had been in a in a wreck. And it was an F, and uh, I I couldn't understand. It didn't it didn't register with me, uh, so I called him on the radio and I said, uh, "What did you say?" And um, they said it was an F, and um, I don't remember anything after that. I don't remember what I said on the radio. I don't remember anything. I just uh, went down there and uh got on scene and uh, it was uh probably the worst feeling i've ever had in my life and um it was uh I, I don't remember what happened after that i know fairfax county police motor squad they they were tremendous they took over everything all the escorts and left it to us to deal with that so um, um, I remember taking they they escorted Mark uh, to the hospital um, where they called Leslie his wife and she came and uh, uh, it was uh, it was a time to remember um, everybody was in complete shock um, and, uh, to relive it is, is not what I wanted to do here, but, uh, uh, you remember every, I remember everything about it. Um, and, um, it was, uh, it was something that, uh, 20 years later still is, uh, very emotional sure. he was a larger than life person and he was you know that trooper that everybody knew and I think we commented several times I've heard from different people that always said if you could go back that day and and talk to the troopers including Mark and pick one of you if one of you had to pick who was going to die that day Mark would have stepped up he would have been a guy that wouldn't have let anybody else do that. I was on 66 uh, when the original call came out about the shots fired off of 95, and I was already headed that way. 
And with our radio system, when you're riding fast on the bike, it's hard to hear everything that comes comes through with the wind noise and all that. And like I said, I was west west on 66 and got turned around probably towards Manassas. And by the time I got to 495, that's when I knew something uh, was going on. I could hear it in a dispatcher's voice. I heard Dean's uh, transmission asking for verification. And I just knew from the voice of the dispatcher that something wasn't right. And when I arrived at the scene, I, I, I fell out. And a lot of that day, the rest of it, it's really hard to relive and and remember everything. I just remember the shock and the, the coldness inside. And, and at one point we had to, uh, uh, Matt Hanley, and I had to go to division and meet with Mark's wife, Leslie. Leslie, And I didn't want to leave Mark because, as you know, the investigations take so long. And it was a cold, it was a cold night. And I remember his wife saying, who's with Mark? It's so cold out there. And that's when I got back on my motor and I went back out to the scene until they were done and we could take Mark to the hospital. I'm going to tell a story on him. What the way I was off and, uh, you know, I, I didn't believe what I was being told. So I, I went to division headquarters where he showed up. They brought Leslie. So, you know, I'm big six foot three, strong trooper. Never anything ever happened like this to me before. I go walking in there and I was fine. You know, I'm still not sure what has happened or believing it. And I walk in and <clears throat> so she's in the captain's office, sitting there in, in her chair, just smiling, you know, straight face, happy to see her, hugging everybody. She was worried about us. And I just lost it like a little baby, you know. And uh, I don't remember much after that, but I knew it was real at that point. But then somebody told me a story. Um, so Mark's at the hospital. Patrick here goes to the hospital. Um, it was pretty severe trauma from what I've been told. And uh, before uh, Patrick would let them bring Leslie to see him, she wanted to see him. This one sitting next to me cleans him up, you know, wipes him all down, gets a, uh, one of his hot hands, puts it in his hands because he knows she's going to take him by the hand and warms up his hands. So when she touches him, it's yeah. not cold. So that's beautiful. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough story for sure. You know, and and I know that these stories are deeply personal and not not easy to hear, and certainly not easy to recount. Um, you know, even after so many years, they're raw, they raw, and they come right back. And that's you know that's that's the way we store this information. And, uh, you know, of course, anybody who's done this job for any period of time, many of us have lost people. But this is, you know, especially as we look at the 20th anniversary of the D.C. sniper, this you can't think of one story without the other. And I think that's why it's so important to talk about Mark and his life and his sacrifice and his relationships. You know, so everybody who is listening to this podcast right now also gets a chance to learn who Mark is. Many of them may remember that there was that connection but I would think that there's some people that don't really think of that connection. I assure you that when all three of you who are sitting here see on the news discussions about the DC Sniper 20th anniversary coming up, I know what you're going to be thinking about. And I know what Mark's friends and family are going to be thinking about. But for the listeners, this is part of that collateral damage. This is part of that tragic loss. That name on the wall, Mark's name across the across the street from where we are on the law enforcement campus at the memorial is a direct correlation to what was happening 
and uh, you know an extreme loss um, for for you folks. A, a lot of people don't know that uh, when Mark got killed that day, they arrested those two that night. Uh, just hours after he died, they they arrested those two. So. I consider and we consider Mark to be the last victim of those snipers because of what what happened. Uh, if 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 they had been caught the night before or whatever, Mark would not have been responding to that. So just hours before they caught these people, that's when Mark got killed. Pat, you had brought up uh, a name earlier, uh, Hanley, which I believe is Lieutenant Colonel Hanley at this point. Uh, he was n unable to join us today, but was kind enough to pass along some thoughts. Uh, Matt is uh, is going to read those thoughts to us. I, I, I had a chance to read them before we we went on here and uh, look forward to incorporating that into what we're doing here today. Go ahead, Matt. Sure. And, and uh, as Troy said, this is uh, this is from Matt. It's he um, wrote down his thoughts. And, and I thank you guys for for. Um, you know, sharing those stories, and and the hand warmer story really points to sort of the, the human quality, and I think it's important uh, because that really will resonate with other officers throughout the country uh, who have found themselves in a situation with such a loss. So uh, I thank you for sharing that, and I can tell by by just sitting here how difficult it is, but how important your message is uh, too for the greater law enforcement community out there. So. Uh, I, I'm honored to read this, if you will. It is hard to believe that it has been nearly 20 years since we lost Mark Coslett. His death left a giant hole in a lot of people's lives because he meant so much to so many. Mark knew everyone. He was one of those guys that became your best friend the day you met him. He always had a smile. He always made you feel welcome. He always made you laugh. He was always getting you into trouble. He truly had a larger than life personality. As much as Mark liked to have a good time, he also took his job as a Virginia State Trooper very seriously. Mark was an outstanding police officer with a nose for crime. Mark often trained younger troopers, including me, how to detect verbal and nonverbal clues of criminal behavior. And he was fearless. Mark wasn't the biggest guy but he's one of the toughest I ever met. Mark was killed during the DC sniper, also known as the Beltway sniper attacks that occurred in 2002. I remember the day well. The DC sniper had the whole area on alert. Mark had spent the morning comforting children on their way to school. Later that day, several of us were out on patrol when we received two shots fired calls in rapid succession along the I-95 corridor. As we had done for several months, we all began to head to that area in the hopes of catching the fleeing sniper vehicle. Then I heard the call over the radio that there had been a serious crash and that rescue and a supervisor were needed. It wasn't until I arrived on scene a few minutes later that I found out that Mark had been killed in the crash. 20 years after his death, it is still hard to believe he is gone. I think about him every day. There will never be another one like him. Rest in peace, 968. And this, again, is a letter from Matt Hanley of the Virginia State Police. You know, you'd said something, uh, Dean, earlier that I thought was really profound. And, you know, as Matt was reading that, I, I can't help but get even a clearer picture of who, who Mark Coslett was. It sound, I, by, by the way, everyone was describing him. He sounded like he was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And then I hear in the in this uh, recount that he wasn't the biggest guy. So in my mind, I thought that this, you know, he'd fill up this entire room. But one of the things that you said that, uh, you know, sort of was resonating with me is. He really was the last victim of the D.C. sniper. He really was. And, you know, is that was sort of sinking in. And I was thinking about that. I w I'm wondering is that sort of the general consensus among the Virginia State Police? Uh, was you know I, I know that it's like throwing it's like throwing a stone into a pond when you have that line of duty death and the, the ripples just keep going. Everybody's affected. There's nobody that can be unaffected in the agency. You folks were were much closer to the situation than maybe somebody in a different part of the state would be. But is that 
Was that the general feeling? Is that still the feeling that that he was the, in fact, the last victim? Oh think, yes. Yeah, I think anybody working back then would would certainly say that's the first name that comes to mind. Uh, you know, as the years have gone by, you know, we're a lot younger as a department. I think some of these guys, have, you know, well, you're talking twenty years ago, so some of some of that history has been lost. You know, but uh, absolutely, I think anybody uh, that was on the job back then and shortly thereafter knows who he was and that was the how it was considered. Mm -hmm. You know, this this was the guy in the area, in the division that, uh, so he went undercover on motors, of course. He was a motorcycle man through and through. Um, investigations he was a part of, undercover, brought down, was it the Pagans? A lot of the Pagans. Wow. Uh, I mean, this guy, you know, he's balding a little bit on the top, had long straggly hair and a beard for most of, the, most of his career. He also held a trooper agent position, which I don't mind saying was the department's way of having a few extra agents and paying them a trooper's pay, you know. So he was temporarily assigned to BCI, Bureau of Criminal Investigations, for mm -hmm. a while. Uh, back on 9-11, he was still doing that, too. And uh, But he'd come back to the road for this, so he was clean-shaven. But a lot of the time I knew him, he had a beard. And uh, so I remember him you know, him telling me one time, tell me if I'm wrong, you guys were closer to him back then, that time period. So he goes into court to testify on some of these turds. And... Uh, <laughs> They're sitting up there, and they all they start talking to their attorney. That's not the guy. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know who this guy is. He's clean shaven. He's got his, you know, his Marine Corps haircut. Sure. And uh, then they show a picture of him from back, you know, with his leathers and his beard. And they're like, "Oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> that guy!" <laughs> they probably couldn't believe that he wasn't the one on trial. That's too good. <laughs> oh, he can take that and edit it. Don't worry. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> He's also going to take the tremble out of my voice. Yeah. Or all of my yeah. stories. They, um... But so that's the guy. So the, he also, you know, Matt was talking about he training people, uh, you know, uh, motorcycle gangs, interdiction, how to talk to people. I, I, Mark had, you know, he made friends with everybody, including the people he would stop on the side of the road. And he could talk anybody into anything. So he'd get these guys out of these cars and he'd just start talking to them. Next thing you know, they're handing them, you know, toolboxes full of coffee grounds and Coke and money out of the back of the trunk, you know, to get handed it to their their new friend Trooper Coslett, you know he, he was so good at it. He taught it at the at the FBI Academy, and he taught it at our, our academy all the time. So they uh, he was he was very good at what he did, and he was very good at spotting criminals. We always said that it takes one to know one, <laughs> but um, he would be going down the road, and all of a sudden he that guy's got drugs. And sure enough, he would end up having drugs. So he, he could spot him a mile away. And that's why he was so yeah. good at what he did. So I, it wasn't my academy class. Y'all clean this up if I tell it wrong. So at our academy, you've been there. Mm -hmm. And um, they, we had, they built a new wing and an old wing. And the new wing has two auditorium style large classrooms. You, you, know, you walk in the door at the classroom, there's the staircase that goes down to the front. And there's a little chamber behind both classrooms that are adjoining. So he comes to teach an academy class about drug addiction and motorcycle gangs, more specifically. Now he's, I guess he was in his beard at that point. Was he? Coming he was off? in his beard. He was still doing covert work, so he looked like a, he looked like one of them. So the night before, he takes his motorcycle, personal, he, personal right, motorcycle, his personal bike. motorcycle. Yeah. You know, with the with the uh, aftermarket Clint Eastwood, you know, uh, poncho tied up in the handlebars and the <clears> leather <throat> saddlebags, you know, and and. Uh, yeah, it's a kickstart, I imagine. It what, is, yeah. it was. He rolls his Harley into the academy on the marble floor, right by the marble staircase, right by the Woodson Memorial Gallery where all the killed in the line of duty troopers are. Rolls it down the stairs into the back of the classroom. And then he gives, he, the next morning he gives, his, uh, he gives his class. And then at the end, he walks into the room, starts his motorcycle, comes out, and rides it out of the academy. Up the stairs and out the front door, <laughs> and the captains and the sergeants come out. And, you know, there's probably other people there. They, they come from the second floor to the stairs. They're like, "What? The, what is going? What is that?" The building shaking. <laughs> Did you ever get a call on that one? Hallway. Was he a I got a call on it. I, call I, I took, Mark calls me to take several classes on creative writing. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they took it in stride because he was excellent what he did, but they did not like him riding that motorcycle through the academy. Some type of fire marshal thing, I'm not sure what that was all about, but uh, 
They did not. He, let's just say he never did it again, but he did it that one time, and that was Mark Coslett. But everybody remembers what he said. Everybody learned from what he said. Uh, it was an emphasis thing, you know. Uh, you got a, an attention grabber. But, uh, yeah, I... Uh, uh, it was definitely better than reading a PowerPoint yeah. to a bunch of kids, you know. That, oh, I'm sure it stuck with every single one of them. Oh, yeah. That was one of... 10,000 stories about Mark and the things that he did. Um, we we met yesterday to talk about Mark's stories, and uh, there's some we can tell, and there's many we can't tell, uh, many. Uh, but he was always... That'll be in the next episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was always very good at what he did. And uh, I've got a, a little thing about the 9-11 the day that happened. Uh, Mark was undercover, he had a beard, uh, but he loved the motorcycles. Uh, I was at the academy in Richmond doing a interview panel for new troopers, and when it happened, and they said, go back to Northern Virginia, You're, they're gonna need you up there. So I drove back to Northern Virginia, got on my motorcycle and headed to the Pentagon. And when I got onto 395, I saw three state police motors coming southbound, and the middle one, had a beard. No facial hair in Virginia. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, not yet. He was on a state police motorcycle coming back from the responding. To, he, the only way he knew how to respond to the Pentagon was on a motorcycle. Right. That was Mark Coslett. So uh, I took it in stride like I did everything else. Um, he went back to division, got off the motorcycle, but that was Mark Coslett. He was going to be there. He was going to be wherever he was needed. So that he, was the response. Mark actually called me right before he responded. I was off on injury leave. That, that was Mark, and there was a lot of other stories, but uh, I just wanted to interject that one about uh, seeing a state police motorcycle with, uh, with somebody riding it with a beard, but uh, that he was, he was going to be there. He was going to be the first there. He was always like that, and he was like that the day he died. So. Mark, Mark was the guy that uh, he lived in Springfield, not far from the Mixon Bowl, what we used to call the Mixon Bowl right there at the 395, 495. 95 interchange and uh, near the school, near the office. So every uh, Thanksgiving, but when, when, once he moved to Springfield, he was the guy that would, you know, he'd throw a couple of turkeys in the fryer and him and his wife and his kids. And it was like an open invitation. And at some point, everybody would come through his house, you know, for their on duty Thanksgiving meal, you know. And it was, if you weren't working, you still went to his house if you could that, that day. You know, he had beverages for everybody, you know, those working and those not working. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember that, too, just being at his house, you know, people coming and going. His neighbors loved it. You know, they'd have, you know, 50 troopers in the neighborhood. Back then, everybody liked I liked the, you know, we have take-home cars. Uh, so everybody liked having the troopers in the neighborhood back then. Helps keep traffic slow. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, even this during the sniper, you know, I remember my neighbors were glad that, uh, you know, I had the marked car parked out in front, you know, of the house. I don't know now. Sometimes that has changed, but uh, uh, back then it was something that people were happy that we had, you know. Visible. My wife mentioned one, during the snipers, uh, she wouldn't. She sent me to get gas every time we needed gas. Uh, um, she mentioned something to me that stuck with me over the years. Uh, she said, people don't understand or have never understood that police officers are a target. They're in uniform. They're out there. Uh, everybody can see them and they are a target and she said I think now they understand what a target is because they can't even get gas without getting killed so I, I think that stood out to me most of all as far as uh, as far as what people thought about the snipers it really scared them people were absolutely scared to death um, and they had reason to be uh, but uh, um, she said, that's what police officers see every day. That's what they have to deal with every day. And they, she, they, other, everybody else got a glimpse of what they go through daily. 
One of the things that I think about, of course, uh, just based on the work that we're doing here at the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund and the Officer Safety and Wellness Section, I'm, I'm always interested to hear what what, ser- what sort of services did you have in place in the Virginia State Police 20 years ago when this happened? Was Did you have an EAP, did you have peer support? And, and maybe what's changed since then? If, and and you're, ser- you're currently serving, what's changed since? I, I think mental health has been, has evolved, has, has definitely uh, been pushed to the forefront more than it used to be. Um, I, I never took advantage of any services back then. You know, I don't know that I would have known to do so. I, we did, we've always had so, uh, like peer support people that were identified. I don't mm-hmm. know if they called them SISM teams back then. Mm-hmm. We, we, we do have a, quite an extensive SISM program now. I know some guys yeah, are involved with, in it. With psychologists. And yeah. uh, uh, no, we've yeah. been through it a couple of times uh, with uh, other police officers, other mm-hmm. troopers. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, one of the guys that's not here, Rob Metaconis, was with Mark that day. He couldn't make He's actually in Key West of all places. So but he's fine. He's sitting on the beach. And well, that's good. The storm has passed him. But uh, he was going to come, but he couldn't make it. Prior engagement, and uh, he was really good friends with Mark too. Was uh, shift partner. He, you know, he worked in that Springfield office with Mark. Uh, Mark was one of the guys that he brought along, and uh, actually, I guess his wife now, Kate, was uh, with SISM. I guess the equivalent of SISM back then with the county, Fairfax County Police, and that's how they met, mm-hmm. or at least got more serious. Sure, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, so I mean, you know. It's uh, it's something I think that uh, is more widely accessible now. And Mark, uh, I don't know that it was frowned on back then, but it just you know, big tough troopers don't you know go see people for help. And I think now now it's uh, it's different. It's but, good that uh, it's changing. It's good yeah. that we're kind of minimizing that stigma that, yeah. that was certainly around. Mark was uh, he was the president of an outlaw motorcycle gang called the Booze Fighters. And I will say outlaw motorcycle gang, they did bad things like collect toys at Christmas for the kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were involved in so many charities and everything. It was terrible, but they, they did have a motorcycle club. And these were some of the finest people I've met in my life. Some of them were attorneys. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, they looked the part. Sure. And... Uh, but they were. Uh, that's what he did in his in his off time. Well, most Things of them like around that. here were uh, either prior law enforcement, you know, all, all different agencies, federal agencies, or construction guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was all yeah. contractors and current or former law enforcement for the most part. That's great. So that's how much he loved the motorcycles. If I could, I, the picture that, that you paint is somebody who's larger than life. And and after Mark's accident, in your own lives, did it, it your priorities shift? Did it, did it give you sort of a new look on how you prioritize things and, and how you live your own lives? Uh, using him as a, as a mentor, even after even after the accident, his memory continues to to drive you, and I could see it here that that his memory still made you who you are today, and that you live with that. Uh, but as far as your your priorities. Uh, on the job and in law enforcement and how you looked at things. that shift afterwards? Absolutely. Um, The motor program changed a lot. Um, We, uh, I got a little, well, no, I got a lot more stringent on safety rules and things like that. There was nothing Mark could have done. The the wrecker changed lanes into him. but, so yeah, uh, he he was going down the shoulder. He was going down, down ninety five southbound to get to where the call was, mm-hmm. and traffic was heavy. It was heavy. I guess it was congested. It was stopped or slowed. Right. That's the reason we had the motors. Was the yeah. traffic was so congested. A regular trooper in a in a police car couldn't even get by something that was uh, because the first thing the if if something happened, the first thing that people would do was try to get around on the shoulder, and it would just bottleneck, and then you couldn't get to it. So that's why the motors were. We, so we it was, got a, the motors it was a, a wrecker, wrecker driver, mm-hmm. pulled over onto the shoulder right right in his path as he was coming down. Mm-hmm. And he veered to miss and uh, ran to the guardrail. And uh, he was go, I guess he was going you know, well, response speed. Certainly rules uh, rules changed, safety rules changed uh, um, uh, just a lot. 
uh, changed as far as uh, uh, no one was allowed on the shoulder af after that, um, uh, except for Patrick. <laughs> and we, we were talking about a, shortly after 9-11, uh, this was before Mark's accident, um, there was a tractor trailer a man stole in Richmond and he was northbound on 95. And he had a whole bunch of police officers behind him, but what do you do with a tractor trailer? So they were shooting at him, shooting at his tires from the crossovers. And uh, uh, the cabin called me in, which he did every week or two because of something the motors had done. Um, and Fairfax County, it was two captains in the Fairfax County Police Department were in the office. And he said, Dean, let me show you something. So they showed me a, a film, a video of the Fairfax County helicopter over this truck northbound. Um, and uh, there was about 20 police cars behind it. You could see the puffs of smoke coming out of the crossovers, him shooting. And then you saw two motorcycles on the shoulder on each side passing all the police cars and getting up to the truck. And the captain asked me, he said, Dean, what do, you, what do you think they're going to do? Do you know who they are? I said, I don't know. That you can't tell who they are. I said, we, we know who they are. What do you think they're going to do to the truck once they catch it? Pit it? I said, well, I'm not sure. It happened that they were, the truck was so much damaged that he, that he stopped and uh, he broke down. And one of the motorcycles pulled up to the front of the truck. And you can see the motor guy get off, go to the truck, get into the truck. There was another, mo was it Hanley? Who was John it? Wright. John Wright. Uh, on the other side, and they pulled him out. And Well, they, they tried to pull him out. They tried to pull him out. The part of the story I like is that one's on one side and one's on the other. One of those people might have been sitting next to me. And he was like, I couldn't figure out why I couldn't pull him out of the truck. Every, I would pull and pull and pull. He didn't have seatbelt on. And they realized they were both pulling. It was like, you know, Chinese won, finger way. Pop, find, you know, Chinese, that little thing you put on your finger. So they're both pulling at the same time from two different directions. I, uh, I, I didn't know what to say. And he said, tell him, don't ever do that again. And uh, uh, that was... That was one of the little stories about riding on the shoulder. We should have done something about it, but you just get caught up being in police officers. You just got to get caught up in the chase. Right. You take chances. And uh, I think uh, in this case, everything worked out well. As a matter of fact, the federal agencies had a sniper up above, uh, probably around Occoquan, uh, ready to shoot him because they didn't want that tractor trailer near Washington, D.C. So. Uh, it was good that we stopped him. Um, that, but that is a little story about Patrick. Circling back to uh, what you asked about how things have changed since the sniper and Mark's death. Uh, doing, I remember doing the uh, all the sniper responding to all the calls. All we had was our sidearm on the motors. All the troopers in the cars had were their sidearm and their shotgun. So uh, sometime after that, uh, we acquired the M4s, which was uh, something that could reach out and touch someone. And what we needed that day would, if, if, if we had uh, come up against the sniper. Um, on a personal note, you asked uh, how things changed since Mark's death. Before Mark died, um, I'm originally from West Virginia, and uh, it's okay. Nor <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Northern Virginia is not the, my first duty station that I would have picked, but. The motors and my now wife or what kept me here and i remember being at a at a party at mark's house and my now wife then girlfriend i uh, had brought her and i remember mark pulled me aside at some point and saying you need to marry that one 
and years later I did. Mark, he has touched my life in so many ways. I miss him every day. Lord, it's been said before, larger than life, he's a legend. We do have a lot of stories about Mark, um, um, most of which, like I said, we don't, uh, we can't talk about. Um, but well, it we, sounds like a lot of them led to some sort of memo or something that you had. To <laughs> <laughs> there was a memo. I was, uh, uh, I was determined. I mean, you never thought something like this would happen. Never in a, in a million years. I, we knew it was a dangerous job, uh, and we, we took it in stride. Uh, but when it did happen, things did change all around as far as safety rules, as far as what you could do, what you can't do, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but um, again, thank goodness we haven't lost anyone else. Uh, Mark was the first and the last on in our department. I know Matt Hanley and I were on the mountain uh, when... Tommy Burnell, he was a captain in the Fairfax County Police Department. We were, had a school going on, and uh, Tommy got pushed, a car came over the hill and hit him head on, killed him. Um, you were going back to uh, the support we had, the psychological, the, the psychiatrist and the support. We did have that to a certain level back when Mark got killed. We had troopers assigned to that sort of thing, but not outside people, not outside doctors and psychologists. And one of the things after that, they started looking into that and now we have a, a, a multitude of things. We have uh, uh, psychologists that come in and uh, we had one that uh, uh, has is with the department, uh, who's hired with the department for stuff like that. So uh, um, that was good, but back then. They even put it, it's a component in our I guess every two years we have trooper in service. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things they've added. I think they, I don't believe they, they used to do that, but now there's like a <clears throat> mental health and wellness component and uh, SISM, things like that. Yeah, that's great. That's super important. You know, one of the, one of the things that I was talking about earlier when we got started is, is about the memorial and, and how we never forget. And I think as anybody who's listening to this now, there's going to be things that they'll never forget just based on your stories, based mm -hmm. on, you know, kind of your bringing back Mark really to, for us to get to know him a little bit, which, you know, I'm super thankful that I got a chance to get this because when, when John Marshall had said, why don't we bring everybody together and do this? I thought, well, this, this is somebody I don't know, but I, I certainly feel like I know him a lot more now. I see the, the memorial behind you on this, on that picture. And as I'm thinking about never forgetting what, for anybody who's listening right now, before we begin to wrap this up, what is the one thing that each of you want people to to know, want, want people to remember about Mark? Well, he died way too young, but he died doing what he loved doing. He loved his family, he loved his wife and kids, um, and he loved his job, and he was very good at his job. Um, I don't think that I had someone as dedicated as he, as he was. Um, uh, and I, I miss him. I miss him tremendously. Um, uh, and um, to today, uh, I, I miss him today, especially coming back um, and, and doing this brings it all back, which is good and bad. Uh, mostly good. Uh, we get together with the with people and talk old times about Mark, and and each and every time we do that, it, it it's uh, it's helps uh, uh, psychologically. I guess uh, it helps us adapt to what happened, uh, but it you, it never leaves you. And uh, Mark will never leave me until I die, um, uh, and I'll always remember him as. Uh, larger than life. Uh, Mark's one, you know, I think about him every day. Um, you know, we talked before about, you know, knowing him, 
how did that inform my career going forward? Um, Mark was one of those troopers, you know, troopers and police in general, especially lately, there's a perception, you know, that type A personality, almost bully to some extent. Mark did not operate that way. Uh, I saw a trooper that, you know, he, he talked to people. He got on the same level with them. He didn't talk down to people. And that kind of informed uh, how I started to treat people. And I saw the results that he got, uh, the fights he avoided probably most of the time, and uh, the, the level of work he was able to achieve. And so that's kind of how I remember him too is here's a different way to do this job. This is the way the job should be done. You're not an enemy. You're a partner with the public. And I think that's what I'd want people to remember too is that the police are out there. You know, he, he died. He could have gone home. He jumped on that motorcycle and went as fast as he could to go to this shots fired thing in, in the middle of this crisis because he thought he was going to confront a sniper. And he was racing to the sniper on the side of the road and, and lost his life in traffic. Uh, so that's what the police officers are doing. He, he's the epitome of that. And that's what people should remember is that that's what we're out there to do. That's what uh, do. Yeah, he, he's not a bully asking you for your lunch money. He's out there to protect everybody. And that's how he died. Uh, and, and that informed my career since then. Uh, so. A that's, valuable lesson. Right? Yeah. You know, like Tim said, Dean said, Mark was larger than life. We as troopers, we run to the danger. We don't run away from it. And that's how it's always been. And that's how it was with Mark and the rest of us. Mark's life has touched my life in so many ways. He made me a better father, a better trooper. The way he talked to people that he arrested. Some of these people, he it was like they, he was a friend, a friend to him. And they in turn would tell him about other things that he used. Uh, but <laughs> Mark was the best of the best. And that's how I'll always remember him. Remember him every day. Not a day goes by. I don't, I don't think about Mark Hoslett. Best of the best. Thank you. Matthew, you have anything? It's just uh, listening to the stories and, and the ones you can tell, which uh, uh, it, it sounds like th there's many there. But And I'm thinking of, of, of how he's impacted your life. And I'm thinking of every name on that wall and, and how they stood sort of before uh, they stood as that barrier, if you will, between right they, they, good and evil or uh, uh, putting themselves in the line of danger, running to it, as as you had said, uh, Pat, how he didn't think of the danger. He didn't think of anything other than getting there and to be and to be a protector and how that's really stayed with you, resonated with you, how it's changed your life in, in a way that you live to honor his memory and how what you're saying and, and your stories are, uh, uh, you, I'm sure that we've got uh, officers listening today that there, there are words of encouragement and, and hope in what you've, in, in the stories that you've shared because it's very real and, and, and very personal and, and very genuine how he's impacted you in such a way that uh, you've, you remember him uh, to, he defines, he, he defines much about, much about who you are today. And, and I think that that's, uh, speaks volumes as to the person that he was. It was difficult to come here for you today, but we're so grateful that you did and uh, and shared those stories. But I, I almost want to ask, you know, I want to hear the other stories, too, that uh, you guys uh, have uh, have mentioned. Uh, there's the pub stories. These are pub stories, right? Right. They're all good. 
he was a good person. Oh, I'm sure they yeah. were great. So I'm sitting in the office. <laughs> it, it, no, this this is this is probably PG. This is probably you can edit it. Get ready, Dan. So I'm sitting in the office. <laughs> I think <laughs> there was a trooper, Trooper Hubert. I think you said was there too. Oh my God! <laughs> I'm sitting in the office and um, it this is snowed. February. It's February. Hubert comes in. Dean is in the sergeant's office, which of course had no windows because you know that's where you need to keep sergeants. Is so we don't jump a, out in a small windowless center block room. It's on the second floor. It looks out over the back parking lot where the motor building happened to be as well. I don't know how it got started, but Hubert was his. Oh, I know what it was. Mark called on the phone. He called up to the back office area, the trooper's office, and said, Hey, there's Jones in there. And I think it was Hubert. He's like, Yeah. He's like, Tell him to come to the window. Sergeant Jones, what? Come here. What, what do you want? He comes out of the office. He was like, I think you need to look out the window. He looks out the back window, and here comes Coslet out of the motor building with his motor boots and his Yukon snow hat, you know, with the fluffy ears things. And we, we were all else. issued that. And that's it. Smile. <laughs> and my, my recollection, I don't know if this is just my, I, I feel like he dropped down into a snow angel. No, well, I he might didn't. be wrong, but he, he kind of came out and he stomped around in the snow naked, and then he went back in the motor building. Yeah, Hubert was a young trooper. He Hubert said, didn't know what to do. He was brand new. And he looked at Jones and Jones was like, yeah, that's Mark Casa. And he walks back in the office. Just a, just, a, a, just a weekend snowy afternoon at the headquarters. Just one more thing. We were in Hillsville at the flea market and gun show in southwest Virginia. We rode, rode the motors down there. Um, and we used them because the traffic, you couldn't get through town. It was 200,000 people at this flea market and gun show. The whole town was 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 there. Um and we would take the motors down and work the traffic for for the five days uh, during Memorial. The flea market. The flea market, yeah. Um, Mark was down there, and he had, he would uh, stop the guy, um, chased him, I think, up uh, this hollow and stopped him. Um, and the guy stopped right in front of his house, and in front of his house was a pen, had five dogs, five puppies, five puppies. And they were, they were, they were just... Bloated, mangy, mangy flea, and gross, starving yeah. to death. And Mark asked him about it, and the guy said, "Yeah, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have. To, I can't. I can't afford to feed them, so I'm going to have to get rid of them." So Mark said, "This is Mark Coslett, okay? This is the Mark Coslett that we're talking about." He says, "Well, don't do it. Let me be back in about ten minutes." So he went back, got one of the vehicles, the cars, took it back up there, took the five puppies. And he was not going to allow the man to kill him. So he brought him back down. This was the last day we were we were going to leave that uh, that afternoon. What's Hillsville back to Northern Virginia? What drive is that? It's up eighty one. It's up like eighty one to how yeah, many hours is that to get about home? About four hours, five hours. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, um, we got down to the CVS pharmacy where our, our uh, uh, command post was, and. Um, we asked him, what are you going to do with the dogs? He says, well, I'm trying to give them away and maybe give them some good homes. And the first thing they did, and they're not very bright, okay, I, I wasn't part of this, but they went in and bought some dog food because what else do you do with, with a starving little puppy, you know? So they fed the dogs, and that made them feel good. But then they said, let's divvy them up. Mark took two of them. Uh, Hanley, Hanley took, got one. Hanley he had, had it his whole life. Yeah, yeah. Hanley got one. And they uh, put them in the vehicles. And we got, some lady got one. She wanted one. Uh, wasn't part of this. She just wanted it. So Mark and we all started northbound. We put our motors on the trailers, started northbound on 81. Dogs were in the back seat. About 30 minutes later, all I could hear was screaming on the radio. Oh my! Apparently, the dogs weren't uh, weren't ready for adult. They food weren't. Yet. They weren't accustomed to <laughs> real puppy chow. They, they weren't ready for any food yeah. yet. They, Their diet yeah, changed yeah. dramatically, and they weren't ready for in it. the back seat of the car. You know, and I almost wrecked. I was laughing so hard. That I makes mean, for a long ride. Oh, it makes for a long ride afterward. You know, they, <laughs> next thing we know, we're trying to clean this mess up. They, uh, and but Mark had those dogs for for years you know he had them i mean the the family had them had them for years 
So he was not going to let that guy do that to those dogs. So that that's Mark Costler. That is a great story and a perfect, I think a perfect place to end because that is just too good. Gentlemen, I would like to thank you so much for coming here and, and sharing your, your personal and professional stories. Um, I mean, I know so much more about Mark Costler now, and I think everybody who's listening to this is, you know, really getting a, a, a greater picture. And, you know, it's it, it's so it's so much better now to know who the last victim of the D.C. sniper was. It's greater to know who that person was and, and how much he affected you and, and all the folks that, you know, you, you worked with for years in Virginia with the state police. Um, certainly like to thank our listeners and, and, and Matt, Matt Garcia for being here with us. Um, it, you know, it's been a, it's been a special day. It really has. I wasn't sure how this was going to go. I wasn't exactly sure, but I'm glad it went just the way it did. And I have to tell you, Dean, I worked for a lot of sergeants over the years. I would have loved to work for you. You're exactly the kind of sergeant that I, of course, I also would have been uh, a pain in your backside, like uh, like it sounds like Mark was, but because I, 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 some of those stories resonate with me because maybe I have done some similar things over the years. But sounds like you would have been a lot of fun to work for. The difference is I don't ride a motorcycle so well, but um, I'd like to thank John Marshall too. He's been putting me in tight places for many years now. So he's an amazing man. And and he, he was his sergeant. He no was John kidding. Marshall's sergeant. Well, he started his career as a trooper, believe it or not. That explains a whole lot. I know. And was did. on the motors. Yeah. That is too great. I wish you could have joined us here today, too. I'm sure. He yeah, was there. Me he, too. Came to, he was there that day. He came to the hospital. Yeah. Him and his wife. He's a yeah. fine man. He's, fine. he's a very good man. I'm he's sure he's got Casa stories, too, that he'll never I tell. Be, I bet he does. I bet he does. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, you know, let's never forget Trooper Coslet. Let's never forget his sacrifice. Let's never forget his contributions to the safety of the, the, the folks in Virginia. And it's very clear that you, you guys will never forget who he was and is. And uh, God bless him. God Thanks bless so much. Him. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. In part three of this special series, we'll bring you our monthly episode of Law and Disorder, this time focused on the investigation into the Beltway Sniper. Thanks again to our sponsor for this series on the Sniper Anniversary, Off-Duty Management. You can find them online at offdutymanagement.com. Thanks also to Christopher Mitchell, our Manager of Digital Content and Strategy, for producing today's episode. And many thanks to you for listening to this special series, part of the Precinct 444 podcast network from the National Law Enforcement Museum. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will join us again for part three of 20 years after the Beltway Sniper. This has been a Precinct 444 production brought to you from the National Law Enforcement Museum. Please subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform to stay connected and to receive our latest content as soon as it drops. We would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, comments, and feedback to precinct444 at nleomf.org. You can help us make our content even better. The National Law Enforcement Museum is located at 444 E Street Northwest in Washington, D.C., and is dedicated to telling the story of American law enforcement. We expand and enrich the relationship between law enforcement and the community through educational journeys, immersive exhibitions, and insightful programs. Find us online at lawenforcementmuseum.org. And stay tuned for more podcast content from Precinct 444. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you at the precinct. Precinct.